Hello everyone, welcome to an episode of Christian's Ramblings. And in this episode we're going to talk about how to make the transition from being a rhythm guitar player to also being a solo guitar player. I haven't made an episode in this series in a long time and it's basically a formula in which I'm rambling about a certain topic without a script, without any preparation generally, but in this episode I, I do have a list of talking points and I actually do have some tap because there are some uh, things that I want to demonstrate. So I imagine that you are a rhythm guitar player and it could be a gypsy jazz rhythm guitar player, but you could also be a rhythm guitar player maybe in a blues band or in a funk band and you want to start learning to play solo then this is the video for you and even though i'm sitting here with an art stop guitar it doesn't really matter you can play gypsy jazz on a art stop and you can play regular jazz on a gypsy jazz guitar that is really not an issue at all so i have a list of things that i think you should work on from the beginning and things that you could take from your skills as a rhythm guitar player directly to solo guitar playing. So let's start with the first topic, which is technique. And I'm talking about solo technique. So for technique, I have this acronym, which is ETA, estimated time of arrival. But in this case, it means three different things. The E stands for effortlessness, the T stands for tone, and the A stands for awareness. So let's talk about each of these three aspects and how they relate to rhythm guitar and solo guitar. So the first letter E, effortlessness, you should be focusing on developing an effortless technique. So think back to your beginning days as a rhythm guitar player and how much effort it took to be able to play rhythm, especially when the song is a little bit faster and maybe you have to uh, play many courses, maybe you have to play five courses and you would get tired already after one course or maybe after the first half of the first course and you still had four and a half more courses to go and you would tense up and you wouldn't be able to play or you would really hurt yourself. Now, it took a very long time to get past that, right? You had to play many hours, practice many hours. And the moment you reach that state of effortlessness, you can't understand why it wasn't like that from the beginning because you, just, you don't seem to be doing a lot. You seem to be very relaxed. You seem to be very efficient with your movements. And that kind of mindset you have to take into playing solo because I can promise you, the moment you start playing solo and you start playing single line stuff, you will get the tension back in your hand. And you already have the experience of that not working. And you already have the experience of getting rid of the tension. And you should be focusing on that from the beginning. So the moment you start playing solo lines, and I have an exercise so I can demonstrate things, and you feel the tension, you should actually stop, acknowledge that there is tension, and get rid of it. Watch your right hand. It's probably the, the tension is going to be in your right hand. And see what it is that creates the tension. Most likely it will be one of three things. The first thing is that you probably will be clenching the pick. Now that's something you cannot do in, in rhythm guitar, but you can also not do that in solo playing. But because it's new and it seems difficult, you start clenching the pick. The moment you start clenching the pick, your hand will become tense, your arm will become tense, and you will just feel tense in your whole body. So don't clench the pick. The second thing is that you might actually be flexing your biceps because of the tension you will be there will be tension here and actually that will also create tension in your hand might also result in you clenching the pick that's all related so that's the second thing you should pay attention to and the third thing you should pay attention to is that you might be raising your shoulder because of the tension and again that will result in tension everywhere so it's either the pick you're clenching it's your biceps that you're flexing or it's your shoulder that you're raising. Those three things should be relaxed at all times. So let's go to the next letter before I show you an exercise in which you can practice all of these three things. The next letter is T for tone. You should be paying attention to your tone production from the beginning. And it's just like rhythm. The most important thing about playing music in general, but also about playing jazz is the tone you're producing. Right? It's first it's tone and then all the other stuff comes. Probably it's timing and rhythm, it's it's after that, and then it's which chords are you playing, which phrases are you playing, uh, how well are you uh, playing the changes in your solo. But before all of that, it's tone. So how do you produce a good tone on the guitar? I'm going to talk about that after I talk about the last letter, 
which is A for awareness. And this is closely related to the other two things. It's being aware of what you're doing at all times to the tiniest detail. So when you're working on technique, because that's what we're talking about, you should be paying attention to every little thing all the time. So that would probably mean that you have to slow down. Doesn't matter what you're practicing, could be a lick, could be a solo, could be a technical exercise. It should be very slow. And to make sure that you're doing it slow, you should be using a metronome. So let's go over a simple exercise. Now I have videos with many more exercises and I will list those videos in the description. So if you want to know more about developing technique, please refer to those videos. But the exercise I have for you looks like this. And it sounds like this. One, two, three, four. Let me do it one time a little bit faster so you can hear a little bit better how this flows. One, two, three, four. So the idea is that you play four, three, two, one on one string. And you do the same thing on the next string. Next string. Next string. Fifth string. And then on the sixth string, you're gonna do that again, but you shift one fret up. And then you slide down with your first finger for the last note. So then you're gonna take a metronome and you're just gonna put a very slow tempo. And in this case, we're gonna do the slow tempo so we can pay attention to what we're doing. So first thing we're gonna pay attention to is the effortlessness. So let me get the metronome. And let's put it at, I don't want this video to be too boring, might already be. So I'm gonna put the metronome on, let's say 90, but you might wanna do it much slower. So for effortlessness, I'm gonna watch my right hand and make sure that I'm not making, that I'm not doing any of the three things we we're talking about. Tension the pick, right? Flexing your muscle and your biceps and raise the shoulder. So I want to feel relaxed. Just like when you play rhythm guitar, you want to feel relaxed the same way. That feels good. I don't feel any tension. Let's say I would feel tension in my, uh, in my hand because I'm clenching the pick. Then you should stop, relax, Put the metronome slower, because obviously that fast tempo is creating probably the tension. Do it slower until you can do it without feeling the tension. And that's the time you could maybe uh, push the metronome a little to see if you can do it faster without tension. The second thing was the tone. If you want the details on how to produce good tone, then watch my technique videos that are linked in the description. But the general idea is that you want to have a consistency in your tone. You want every note to more or less sound clear as a bell, right? I don't wanna hear I wanna hear and I'm playing in swing timing, I'm gonna talk about that later. You could also play everything straight, but for this video I'm gonna play everything in swing timing. You wanna produce the same kind of sound on every note. Now your downstroke and your upstroke is gonna sound a little different, that's okay. But you want every downstroke to sound like every other downstroke and every upstroke to sound like every other upstroke. So again, I'm gonna do the metronome and I'm gonna pay attention to the evenness of the sound, clear as a bell for every note, and of course also pay attention to the effortlessness. There's also an exercise like this but uh, it goes up. It's the same principle, but we go up like this. So I'm gonna play down and up, again, paying attention, being aware of my effortlessness and my tone.
that felt good. It sounded good to me. Of course, you got to take it slow, slow tempo, and really be very strict with yourself. And if you want to do the ultimate test, you should record yourself and listen back. Are you producing uh, a consistent tone? Maybe you can even see the tension in your arm and your hand when you see yourself on the video. So let's go to the second topic. So we talked about technique. The second topic uh, is timing. Timing is very important. And you know that as a rhythm player, you know as a rhythm player that your tempo should be very consistent. And you know as a rhythm player that if you play with a solo player who has questionable timing, it doesn't feel good. It just doesn't feel good. It doesn't matter if your tempo is solid. Now, I've seen this happen a lot with um, dedicated rhythm players. They start playing solo or they maybe learn a theme. And when they were playing rhythm, it was super solid, uh, was swinging. And then the moment they start playing solo, that is all gone. And that shouldn't be the case because as a rhythm player, you know what sounds good because that's the people that you want to play with. You should be striving to sound like that. Now, having good timing on guitar is particularly difficult and every guitar player I know has trouble with it, including me. Sometimes my timing is very good, sometimes my timing is not as good. I can, I can hear that when I hear myself play and I've made hundreds of videos, so some videos my timing is excellent, some videos my timing is it's still okay, but it's not where I want it. So it's a constant struggle and it's something that you always have to work at. I will link a couple of videos about timing, check those out, they're all about that and how to practice it. But I have some tips here for you to start thinking about. The first thing to think about is that you should practice it with a metronome, but not in a single way, but in varied ways. So don't always put the metronome on one, two, three, four, or on one and three, or only on two and four, but change it up, right? Sometimes practice with the metronome on one and three, sometimes on two and four, sometimes only on beat two, sometimes on beat four, sometimes on beat one every two bars, stuff like that. Just like you would be doing as a rhythm guitar player to get the consistency. But now there's an extra element, and that's another point, another bullet point, and that's the consistency of the swing timing. There we have it again, the consistency. You want, when you play swing timing, that every short note is as long as every other short note, and every long note is as long as every other long note, because a swing rhythm is long, short, long, short, long, short, long, short, long. Now you want all those no long notes to be equally long, and all those short notes to be equally short. You don't want to play like this. That is the basis of shaky timing. It's not so much playing ahead or behind. It's this that's creating the shaky timing. It's inconsistent swing timing. So you can do that exactly with this exercise, right? So we're gonna, I'm gonna do it again, and I want you to pay attention to see if my timing is consistent. And I'm gonna put the metronome, let's do it on two and four for now. Three, four, one, two, three, four. Ding, 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 ding. I always sing first to, to make sure that I have it, that I have the tempo. Ding, 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 long, short, long, short, long, short, long, short. Like that, but you can do this with everything you do. So let's say you're playing Donna Lee, like I was playing in the beginning. You can start working on Donna Lee playing a solo and try to make a solo that consists mainly uh, of eighth notes and only mind your swing timing. So you could play wrong notes, uh, but it doesn't really matter because you are paying attention to the consistency of your swing timing. So it would sound something like this. Let's do a little bit faster. Let's do 110. One, two, three, four, do da do de do de do do one, two, three, four. Thank you. 
So I was only trying to pay attention to my swing timing and I noticed some places where it could be better. Of course, I was also trying to play the right notes, but that was not so much the point. And you could do this with anything. You could do this with a exercise, you could do this with a single lick, or you could do it with a song like I just did. Now, there's one more aspect of timing that I didn't talk about, and that's what I call a clear start and clear ending. And that means that if you play something, when you start, it should be a very clear start, right? It shouldn't be something that starts up slowly or, or it is a kind of a vague start and the ending is also not clear. You should play something that's really like, something like that. And even if it's an exercise, you could create these startings and these endings on the fly. You could say, okay, I'm gonna play this exercise starting on the high E string. I'm gonna stop at the low A string, something like this. One, two, three, four. Let's do it to um, the B string. Let's do one note earlier. So you can see I have a clear starting point and a clear end point because lots of timing mistakes also happens because people don't know how to end nadir and then it becomes kind of vague and then the first thing that starts happening is that the timing is gone. So uh, train yourself from the beginning to always have a clear start and a clear end point. And that will translate once you start playing solo in the same habit of having a clear start and end point for your lines. That will help tremendously in keeping that swing timing consistent. Let's go to the third topic, which is vocabulary. So for vocabulary, I would suggest you start working on several licks or fundamental shapes, as I call them, to get started having clear ideas to play over chord progressions. Now, I don't want to go into that too much in this video because basically every video I make is about that. But lots of people ask me, where do I start with your videos? Because there are so many videos. So if you are an absolute beginner when it comes to solo playing, and I assume you are because that's why you're watching this video, right? You're a rhythm guitar player and you want to play solo. You should start with a series I have called One Idea. And I will link the first episode of that series in the description. That's a very good place to start. And also a video called Fundamental Shapes. And I will link that video as well. Now I put one shape that I think is very important on this sheet just uh, for completion. Because if you want to download this uh, PDF, this tab, you can join my Patreon. And it will be available for the lowest level, even the $5 level. And on this uh, PDF... There's a tab for the diminished shape, which is very important. And it's also a good technique exercise. So it sounds like this. One, two, three, four. This is a shape that's very handy to learn for improvisation, but also as a technique exercise. That's why I put it here. So if you download this, you already have three exercises you can get started with. You don't have to watch any other video of mine. You can get started with these three exercises for your technique and your timing. But if you want to know more and how to use this shape, then watch the videos I'm linking in the description, the series One Idea and a video called Fundamental Shapes. That brings us to the last topic for this video, which is repertoire. It's very important that you start working on songs from the very beginning. Don't get lost in just working on the 251 or just working on E7. I mean, you, you still have to do that, but you should do it in the context of a song. So if you're working on E7, then do it with the idea in mind that you're going to use that stuff on a song with E7, like Sweet Richard Brown or Joseph Joseph or Minor Swing, whatever. Now, people ask me which songs, which songs should I start with? And there's always three songs I recommend, and I just want to name them. To start with is Dinah. And the reason for that is that it's basically almost a modal song in the sense that the A parts are G and the B part is E minor. Now, there's many more chords. Uh, which makes it sound more jazzy, but you can get away with just playing G stuff in the A part and playing E minor stuff in the B part. And Dinah is also the song I use in my One Idea series. So it's good to learn it anyway, because if you're gonna work on that series, you gotta learn Dinah. Uh, if you don't know that song, I made videos about Dinah, I will link those, and there's also a backing track for Dinah on my channel. The second song you should learn is Honey Soccer Rose. Why? Because Again, it has some chords in the A part that are held for a long time because the first four bars are basically C7 and the second four bars is basically F. So you have a long five and a long one chord. So it's excellent to practice your dominant ideas and your one chord ideas and to make a transition. But then the bridge is a two, five, one, 
to B flat, which is great. And then there's another 2-5, but then the 2 chord is a dominant chord, it's G7. So that introduces some other very important progressions. And then the third song you should learn, if you're a gypsy jazz player, it should be minor string. Just because you start working on a minor tune, which is quite different from working on a major tune. And also, um, it has that 1-4 progression in minor, which is something that happens all the time in gypsy jazz. Not so much in uh, straight ahead jazz, but even if you're a straight ahead jazz player, I think it's still good to learn minor string, just because of all the diminished arpeggios you can use, and it's just very handy to have that in your fingers, because you can use it on other uh, jazz standards as well. So that was it for this video. It's just mainly me rambling, uh, which is apt, because that's the name of this series. I hope it was useful. Let me know if there is anything else that you think I missed, or if you have questions, ask me in the comments. I will monitor the comments and answer those questions. If you want to have access to the PDF for this lesson, uh, take a look at my Patreon and you will get access to much more stuff. And there's so much stuff there, hundreds of videos, uh, videos I made especially for Patreon. If you are serious about wanting to learn how to play jazz guitar, then uh, my Patreon is chock full of uh, great information. If you like this video, give it a like, uh, maybe subscribe so you will be notified of my next video. And uh, I will see you all in that next video. Bye.